Oh gosh. <laughs> I surrender. <laughs> Jackie, over to you. Thank you. Um, as you said, I'm Jackie Chapman, I'm the managing director of your capital city college training. We are part of the largest further education and college group in London. We encompass Westminster Kingsway College, City and Islington College, and the College of Harringay and North North East London. So at any one time we have about 30,000 students. And pre-pandemic, we had about 2,000 apprentices. At the moment, we're about 1,400, so we haven't quite recouped our numbers during the pandemic. My role looks at a number of things. It's about the apprenticeships and the impact that we can have um, with Net Zero for the apprenticeship programs we run, but it's also looking at different initiatives and how we can combine them and link them together. Now, with the importance of green skills, we did bid and were successful in winning a GLA contract for a green academy. And what we're looking at is how can we actually utilize that along with apprenticeships to have the biggest impact. When people talk about green and apprenticeships, they default to construction. It's not just about construction. Yes, there are heat pumps, solar panels, um, and the cross-skilling between um, electricians and plumbers to be able to do more in the green skills. But every single apprenticeship role should be focused on green. And at the moment, although there is a review um, going to take place of apprenticeship standards, the reviews are too slow to really have an impact. So what I want to look at is how we can actually make change happen much quicker to understand that every apprenticeship role, whether it be a project management apprentice, procurement, business admin, how they can impact positively for their employer looking at climate change and how to be more energy efficient within their own business. Within CCCG, we have um, we are part of a, a bid that we put in for the development fund with other colleges to invest in digital skills that link into the green economy because a lot of people don't realize a lot of people don't realize that energy efficiency is not just about gas and electric bills with code if we look at some of the older code that we use python it uses twice as much energy as some of the new code because it's more efficient and effective so we have to look at every element of the business in terms of asks, we're looking at three things from the government. First of all, it's about flexibility of funding. Colleges are very well placed to support the retraining and development of skills needed for the green industry, but our funding is restricted. If we're looking to hire an electrician or a plumber to do training, then it will cost us about £45,000 a year. If we're looking for somebody with the real industry experts in green skills, you're looking at £60,000 a year. And those skills are few and far between. So we have to pay more to get the right people teaching the skills to the next generation. We also want to continue to use the levy to actually support more than 16 to 18 year olds. The number of starts coming for friendships for 16 to 18 year olds is not where it should be. And we are um, back in the, the, the call to have a friendship levy funding used for the first six months wages for the 16 to 18 year old. And third and finally, what could we do today that could have an impact for every apprentice in the green agenda? We believe that we should add on a green unit to every apprentice. This doesn't mean that we have to change the standards, which is a very slow process. You can add on an element in the same way as previously we've added in British values and equality and diversity. There are a number of, uh, of really good small qualifications like the award in environmental sustainability. If it was added into the levy for every apprentice, that would mean that there would be 330,000 people this year going into businesses with a thought process about environmental sustainability and how to make the best out of their business. I think that's five minutes. Sorry, I've got to talk very quickly. Thank you very much. Yes, no, that, that's really helpful. And thank you for your, your three key areas too. That's kicked us off in a very helpful way, Jackie. Thank you. I think we now come to Beatrice. Is Beatrice online? Beatrice, who's the head of public affairs and policy for Engineering UK. So, Beatrice, over to you for your five minutes. Um, thank you. Thank you for having me. And sorry, I couldn't be there in person this afternoon. So, um, yes, I was asked to outline the importance of green skills in tackling climate change and the, and the role apprenticeships can play in this, uh, to discuss our work in uh, on apprenticeships in net zero and discuss our you know key asks uh, to government in promoting apprenticeships and net zero agenda. 
Um, on the first point around the importance of green skills, and as I will say I will talk about the importance of engineering skills rather than green skills, because I think there's a that's what we are, but also engineering will be absolutely vital in um, the endeavour to move to net zero. And in effect, um, all we will need to be green um, in uh, in the future. Um, so there will be, you know, we need them for wind farms, battery technology, hydrogen, and all of these different technologies out there that uh, will help us to get net zero. And they are the industries of the future. So we know that there is growing demand. Um, uh, so an engineering UK report, um, like recently on the Netzio workforce, tried to understand what is the demand for engineering skills in the sector. Um, and um, while it found that there is no, <laughs> there's lots of different timeframes and understanding of like the um, the numbers. Um, actually, what it does show is that there's a general growth uh, in, in, in that area of work. Um, and um, that is has also been um, obviously um, supported by other reports, such as the Green Jobs Task Force reports, for example. Um, but against that backdrop, we also have a persistence and growing skills shortage. And um, and I think it's uh, really like in, in this sector, um, Engineering UK analysis pre-pandemic projected shortfalls of between 30,000 to 59,000 um, engineers and meeting annual demand for 124,000 core engineering roles like at level three and plus. Um, but we are pretty certain that the pandemic, the UK's decision to leave the EU and recent government policies such as the British energy security strategy and our move towards net zero um, will have, you know, put an upwards pressure on that. Um, so there's definitely a growing demand, um, growing skills shortage in the sector. And um, as a result, businesses are unable to recruit sufficient engineers and technicians. Um, and the situation at the moment is predicted to get worse. Uh, worse. And the greatest level of reported skill shortages is, is within the advanced skill role. So A-level, advanced apprenticeships, and other level three qualifications. So um, apprenticeships play a really, really important part in um, trying to mil meet these skill shortages uh, going forward, which is why we at Engineering UK have made that um, sort of one of our key areas of exploration um, as it stands. Um, so then this moves me sort of nicely on to like the work that we are going to do uh, on net zero and engineering skills. Um, uh, so I, I wanted to share a graph, but I'm not, not going to because five minutes don't really allow that. But it kind of brings us back to the like the, to the um, fall in ultimately engineering apprenticeships, and I'm going to just do it with my hands. But like, <laughs> if you look at it, there's a sustained extreme fall of like in the engineering and manufacturing technology side, and a kind of ultimately stagnation in a lot of other engineering related um, apprenticeships over the last six seven years, um, six to six years approximately. And we really want to like understand why that actually is like, you know, why, why if there is such a demand for the skills and if we need these skills to move towards net zero, is this a demand or supply side issue? Don't we have enough young people coming through or is it that actually not enough apprenticeships opportunities are being um, offered? What, what, is, what is the driver behind this? Is it linked to kind of growth areas of like the economy? So like, is it like in the net zero sex, you know, economies? Um, is there growing demand for apprenticeship or offer of apprenticeships and growing number of apprentices going in? Um, or is there not? Um, and actually that is kind of something that we really want to explore and are going to do um, some further work on over the coming months. Um, so you might hear more from us on that. Um, in terms of our asks, um, as a result of this, we, we haven't like, you know, we don't have any clear recommendations as yet around apprenticeships and engineering apprenticeships particularly, um, because our work is around uh, develop, developing this further, understanding this further, um, and um, uh, you know, and, and coming up with recommendations that are based on that evidence. But what we would ask is that um, 
that the government and uh, those looking into those issues work with us on this. Listen to what we have to say. Listen to what the sector has to say, and um, and then act on those recommendations. Because if we are to have a thriving economy whilst also achieving net zero going forward, we will need those engineers to come through the pipelines and for young people to take you know, to move into it, but also for older people to be retrained um, and apprenticeships will be a really important part of that. Um, so the only thing I'd like to add to that is um, from our perspective is that we definitely need a greater focus on level three opportunities because that is something that we have observed and, and getting younger people to go into those. Um, so I'm gonna leave it at that um, and I'm happy to take some questions later. I can't hear you. Okay, I was speaking. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. I say, I think one of the problems is that schools do not encourage young people into engineering, and particularly when you're talking about level three, that should be. We need more of Lord Baker's uh, University Technical College or something. Oh, right on cue. Look at that. <laughs> Our third speaker enters just as he's due to speak. Toby, very, very well. So thank you very much indeed, Beatrice. That's really, really helpful. No, no, he's about to know. He's only just arrived. Right. You're Toby Perkins. Yes. I am. He is indeed Toby Perkins, yes. Where would you like me to say it? Uh, well, I think the only chair that's left, Toby, is there. Okay, will they be able to see me on the screen? Uh, sure. Oh, there's one here, actually. Okay. So they might, if they want, if you want to be seen as well as heard. Okay, I'll move down. Take my chair, Mark. No, no, no. I think we have to be okay, the side of the table. table. Yes, I think I was told we have to be the side of the table. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, shall we come to questions later? Ken? I think, yes, I think if we hear from Toby, then we'll have questions after that, but I'll certainly be happy to bring you in first then. Right, so now, a very warm welcome to Toby Perkins, MP, Shadow Minister for Skills and Further Education. That's good, isn't it? It is indeed. Good. Well, thank you so much um, for the invitation. I apologise for being late. I've been stuck in the lift for the last 10 minutes. So um, when we're talking about green skills, we're going to lift engineers, which is fine. And, yes. uh, uh, they've been well occupied here in Parliament. But, yeah. uh, yeah, we um, have but, no, uh, but anyway, it's, um, it's tremendous to be here. Um, and it, it is an incredibly important issue um, for us in the Labour Party and, and absolutely for the country um, to recognise the uh, need we have for um, skills within uh, within this uh, part of the, the plan towards net zero. And of course, the economic opportunity um, that's provided by, it's provided by um, the push towards net zero also. Um, and it's also great to be here, um, of course, because it's Green Careers Week um, uh, and it's uh, a renewed focus this week um, on uh, green careers. In fact, in the conversation that I had um, just an hour or so ago, I was informed uh, that Britain is going to need 400,000 new workers in the energy uh, sector alone uh, if we are to achieve uh, zero by 2050. Um, and in a whole variety of areas, um, there is a, a huge need um, to attract more uh, people into these sectors. Um, and apprenticeships, I think, play an incredibly important part within that. Um, I think our view uh, on uh, net zero is there is obviously um, an environmental uh, necessity for us to do this, but there is also an economic necessity, and there is. Um, we need to see climate change not just uh, as something that we have to do um, environmentally, though, of course, we do, um, but also we should um, seek uh, to become world leaders and, and maximize our own opportunities uh, in this uh, sector. Um, and uh, Keir Starmer um, spelled out at the recent Labour Party conference that the targets for net zero are also a key part of this industrial and economic strategy. Um, so I, I think that's absolutely right. Um, in terms of the uh, apprenticeships, um, we want to see young people uh, moving into a green environments uh, and green uh, opportunities. Um, but I think it's also about embedding uh, the search for green opportunities in every aspect of the school curriculum, in every aspect of, of what we're thinking about. It's not about simply thinking about green 
careers in the very narrow context of, uh, of people um, installing solar panels or, or you know, very directly uh, around green energy, but actually embedding those thought processes in all of the um, careers opportunities that, that exist. In terms of our approach, um, we announced at the recent uh, conference that um, we would be looking to reform the apprenticeship levy to uh, turn it into a, a growth and skills levy in which um, the 50% of the money would still be directed uh, absolutely purely at apprenticeships. For those organisations who, who use all of their levy or, or want to use all of their levy on apprenticeships, still be able to do that. Um, but there would be the other 50% of that would be able to be utilised um, for uh, approved courses that might not fit uh, in, in with apprenticeships. For example, uh, retraining motor vehicle engineers uh, to uh, to develop their skills in electrical vehicle engineers, retraining uh, heating engineers um, to install uh, heat pumps, and a whole variety of, of other kind of uh, environments like this. We, we think that apprenticeships are absolutely crucial. They, they must uh, remain the gold standard, um, but uh, we need to also recognise that when £2 billion a year is being sent back to the Treasury unspent, uh, that there is uh, still far too many um, opportunities being missed within this. Uh, and I've been along to um, see independent providers who've got really fantastic um, provision uh, alongside uh, many colleges that have also. And so apprenticeships, the apprenticeships regime needs to work for independent providers, for colleges, for employers, um, but crucially, it needs to reach uh, young people um, and workers right across uh, all aspects of our society. Um, we've got underrepresentation of fame communities within apprenticeships um, in terms of technical uh, apprenticeships and a massive underrepresentation of women also. Um, so we need to, to make sure that apprenticeships are seen as an attractive option for everyone. Um, I think one of the key things within that is making sure that schools see that uh, one of their students going on to an apprenticeship is just as much of a success uh, as seeing one of their young people going into university. That um, apprenticeships shouldn't just be something that are there for those who don't make uh, A levels, but they should be uh, that straight A students uh, and their parents want to see um, pursued as well. Uh, and so we would like to see within our schools not just that narrow focus on trying to shove everyone into the sixth form and then into A level. But actually making sure that everyone gets uh, a wider uh, variety of opportunities. Um, so uh, th there's a great deal more that I can say, but I think we can maybe pick that up in, in questions. Uh, um, and um, uh, you know, uh, you know, to sort of say in, in summary, um, you know, we absolutely think that apprenticeships are key, uh, that uh, using the economic as well as environmental imperative. Um, to be world leaders in net zero is, is crucial. Uh, and uh, you know, it's a sort of approach we be taking. Absolutely, no. And I entirely agree. I think it's iniquitous that this money goes back to the Treasury. I cannot understand why the apprenticeship levy money that's not spent doesn't go back into apprenticeships. And just on your point, I was in, in the coalition government, the heady days of coalition government, I was in Michael Gove's team. And I can remember saying to him, why didn't he insist that schools celebrated their apprentice students? With the same enthusiasm as their universities. What a very good idea, Sue, he said, and did absolutely nothing about it. Because, if, you know, if it had come, if DFE had sent out the message, look, celebrate your apprenticeships, then the schools would have done it. But of course, they didn't, so they're quite sad. Anyway, we'll now move. I think Ken is very anxious to ask a question. Yeah. Well, then, I've been here several times, you've moved the word curriculum because um, uh, the, the, uh, a six year apprentices have been a failure two years. They've declined at both ages for two years. And the Institute of Apprentices has done nothing to address that. I think mean, the family managed body is a modern body in my view. Um, and in the recommendation of the selectors who have worked out a law on that, we recommended that two thirds of the apprentice levy should be spent on 16 to 24 euros and not on adult education. Uh, when I was educated, I had, I had a separate budget in adult education and companies paid for it. And they just passed all this on to on the levy. But could I just say this? Um, you mentioned the green and uh, net zero agenda. You said 500,000 energy. 
Um, you have also seen the report that by 2030 we're going to need 300,000 in the green subjects. The only subject at A level in which you can discuss to learn anything about global warming is geography. I learned this from my grandson, who just done his GSE. He's very bright and mathematician, clearly would get a very good A level in that. He's given up maths in his field, geography, which in my day was a sort of cop out subject. Because it's the only subject where you can do the warming and the, what the effect, and it's not into the into the ordinary curriculum in schools. And I think that the GOAT curriculum of eight academic subjects in the 1904 curriculum will have to be abandoned very soon and expanded, which is reduced to five: English, maths, two sciences, and data skills. And then we can take in all the other subjects that we want, a technical curriculum. And I think that's. What I think we're trying to urge your colleagues to do. I think your department will be very opposed to it, but the Department of Education is against change. They have refused. They, 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 they've actually, the Department of Education has you know, said, cut support for technical education by 20%, as you would appreciate. They did nothing to arrest the decline in design technology in schools. And actually, the decline in technology in schools has been brought by James Dyson, our greatest industrialist, who's leading the master plan. And so I think there's got to be a late suggest. Uh, the real whole terms will be shaped over the next few years of teaching in the curriculum in 11 to 16 year old students. Only 11% of the youngsters in 11 to 16 year old students have like 70 people. And since 2006, yeah. only 11% of students have been to do their thing to be in the South. That's 11%. So 90% are not studying data skills or computing at all. At all, I would say. In since 2016, recruiting and skill in schools is not at all. This in a name. We have had a curriculum theory which recognizes that artificial intelligence is the very going for It is important to them. Mm. It is going to be deeply embedded in schools from primary on. Thank you very much. Emma, I, we've got to q and I've got the agenda as far as that. So may I now defer to your proper chair? Yeah, yes. uh, right. Yeah, yeah just um, if people could direct their remarks to the television screen as well, because I think the microphone is embedded somewhere here so that everyone can hear us. Oh. Lovely. Okay. Huge, huge apologies. We've had some really good input from Jackie and Toby and Beatrice, who've uh, um, already done their presentations. But anyway. Fantastic. Hello. 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 Great to see you here. So, who's next up? Well, I don't know whether that was a speaker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I just wonder whether our speakers might like to. Uh, yeah, so we start with Toby. Yes. Yeah, it's okay. All right. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I agree with a, a great deal that you said there. Um, I think uh, legally, there, there probably would be difficulties um, in terms of uh, actually saying that you've got to be under 24 to um, get an apprenticeship. Um, but I think that where, where we definitely agreed with your amendment in the skills bill was around making sure more of that apprenticeship funding is spent at level two, level three at the entry points um, than you know, some, some organizations that are spending you know, the vast majority of it on MBAs and level six, level seven. That's not what we envisage the apprenticeships being about. Um, so we were right on board with, with several of your uh, excellent amendments um, to the skills bill. I think in terms of the subjects, um, you know, your point is, is an important one. I think the government are attempting to address that to an extent in that there is an A-level planned um, in terms of climate change. But I also absolutely agree with your point um, that it needs to be embedded into all subjects. It shouldn't be something, you know, climate change shouldn't just be something you study in isolation. But we should um, embed it into into all aspects, and I think your point on computing um, is also well made. I think that um, the difficulty is we in the GOV era, he was a tremendous one for trying to tell everyone what to study, um, and of course we had the EBAC, um, and we had a sudden spike in in the subjects that he um, he sort of suggested schools should. So they always thought that Michael Go basically just wanted every child to have exactly the experience that he'd had at school yeah. um, but because he didn't like sport and music he, he didn't want anyone else to do it and, and he wanted everyone to do the subject that allowed him to look clever um but uh so, so you know it's not always been a complete success the government's trying 
and draw a too narrow link, what everyone should study. But I think for us as a nation to consider what that says, where only 11% only of students are studying computer science is, is a, a very sensible um, point indeed. And I think we do need, uh, and, and this is, I think, where it comes back to your amendment about yeah. careers guidance, because yeah. the problem is that in schools, too many children don't really see the link between what they're yeah. studying yeah. and where it's going to take them. And so actually, if you have careers guidance at 11, you start though, to put those pathways in place because uh, from the age of 11, it's not just I'm doing history today, I'm doing geography tomorrow, I'm doing maths the day after. It, I'm studying these subjects because I'm on a pathway to somewhere and it, it brings every one of those subjects alive. Um, and so we see um, careers guidance, uh, employers getting into the school, uh, in, in, you know, through the school gate and talking about the, the various opportunities that exist as absolutely transformational for so many children. Um, and so we absolutely, whilst recognising how busy schools are, um, want to open up those doors and get uh, employers in through the, the doors to speak to children so that um, they, they can be thinking about the careers so that when they're coming to choose their subjects at 14, they've already got an idea as to the pathway it might take them on. And so if we've done all that work, it, it actually will address things like the, the fact we've got smaller numbers doing computing science, uh, and other things. Whilst I also think we need to recognise that that um, you know, different children will study different things. We shouldn't dismiss the value of sports, music, any of those things. So but you need to get it before 11. You must get careers guidance into primary schools because little people start. Yeah, well, I think we've got other people who want to speak. For the last 12 years, a lot of women have been able to the speech you've just made. So I have optimism in you. Thank you. I, I, well, I've got optimism in you, and I have to say, I'm awestruck by your hologrammed shirt co collar and coat here. I mean, I've never seen such a thing. You have your initials in your shirt coat, don't you? Um, this is something I'm going to be looking for. Yeah. Well, we've got now a real opportunity to grow that up here. Um, but over to you, and then link together what both of you said, because when you were talking about embedding green in all curriculum and all day curriculum's events about how we go further. Um, before you arrived, I got to speak first. And my, mm -hmm. my primary request was if we should add in green to every apprenticeship, because we so often talk about engineering mm -hmm. instruction. And actually, every apprentice role can have a positive impact on the green agenda. So if we use part of the levy funds, to add in a green element to every apprenticeship, this doesn't mean that we have to take years changing the standards. We can actually take that back to the businesses. So your apprentice is going to evaluate your business and where they could make a positive impact. Is that just turning the computers off at night or is it something far more substantial than that? And training providers, colleagues, we can add that teaching element in if the funds are there to do that. So I think, yes, embed green in every role. And this is part of the challenge with careers guidance. You're right about apprenticeships and guidance in school. It's non-existent. But in terms of looking at careers, we get a lot of young people come to us and asking, I want to work in a green industry. I want to have an environmentally friendly job. There are very, very few jobs that you could apply for that are specifically about supporting um, climate change. It's how you look at the careers that you could have an impact in. Engineering has been talked to about a lot here. There are very few jobs at the moment in wind farms, et cetera, but they are the energy of the future. So how do you start now with that as your long-term goal? Yes. So the careers guidance is about how you impact every single job in the, the mm -hmm. agenda. Did Beatrice want to come in on any of the remarks made so far? Um, yes, just to like really say that they absolutely agree on the importance of careers guidance and like a careers, I would broaden it out actually to careers provision, that's what we sort of call it, bringing in the, the idea of inspiration events, which are really, really fundamental and I don't know whether people know about Engineering UK in more detail, but we, we run um, uh, some things like the Big Bang Fair, which is exactly th that kind of thing aimed at young people to inspire them into sort of these careers of the future. Um, and within those um, uh, events that we do like and, and um, programs, we, we very much talk about apprenticeships and technical routes as a way into, into those careers. We've also, um, we, we wrote a report about that uh, a little while ago, securing the future. And I think it is also really important to embed the careers thinking or like careers 
guidance in the curriculum as well. It's like, you know, the, we're talking about greens, um, uh, the, the sort of information and, and knowledge about uh, climate change in the curriculum. Um, on the point around like the, you know, the levy and, um, and the focus on under 24s, like um, I have to say, well, I think we, we, I share some of those, um, uh, at least the thoughts, like, and it might not be legally possible and like, you know, and what, what is the best solution to that, I think remains to perhaps be seen, but um, something that ensures that like um, apprenticeships really train the next generation um, that we so desperately need to come through and ensuring that it does kind of provide those level three, level two apprenticeships, I think will be really key as well as like for upskilling, you know, but I think it shouldn't be, one shouldn't come at the expense of the other. I think that's the key thing. We need more of all of it. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, interesting uh, remarks on that. I mean, this, the, obviously training the next generation, but we do need to retrain the generation that we have now as well. I don't know if anyone would like to come in on that point. Uh, well, it's not specifically on that. Oh, well, okay. but, and first of all, just to apologize for coming late and, and missing um, uh, the, um, the speech at the beginning. Um, and secondly, very strongly agree with the idea of having a green element embedded in every apprenticeship. And of course, every apprenticeship would also embed a digital element. So those two things are going to come out. And the third thing was, like probably many others, I had an interesting email from the Ornamental Horticulture Round Table Group the other day, maybe yesterday, uh, bringing to my attention some of the fantastic opportunities um, that there are in horticulture and, um, uh, and uh, landscaping. Um, and I was uh, uh, very struck by what Lord Baker said, you know, about geography being the only green thing you could study at school. It seems to me that horticulture, I mean, you know, even, even if it's just doing your own little bed that, that one used to do at school, but there are huge opportunities there. Uh, it is the ultimate green thing, it's green by, um, by definition. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's maybe something that, uh, uh, I mean, I was just quite struck at the arguments they were making that they needed to be apprenticeships and pathways and above all understanding of the opportunities. I mean they're, they're talking about potential of uh, 700,000 jobs or something like that. So it's quite serious, um, quite serious stuff. And if um, if nobody else has seen it, I will I will look forward it to the uh, uh, secretary. Yeah. 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 If I may, that's come up recently. We I went to a conversation with the London Chamber of Commerce. We were looking at horticulture, particularly in London, and again, a lot of people think about the big parks, etc. But living walls have become such a major area now that a lot of businesses could get involved in. And where does it sit? Is that sculptural? Is that construction? Is that horticulture? And it's somewhere between mm -hmm. all of those skills. But it's how we start to build up that skill set. And we're very good at it. That's another thing. You know, really, you know, the, the English and gardening are sort of very, very closely connected, and landscaping and all those things. We want cap capability baker is what we need to make some lots of the world. Yeah. 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 It's not due to it. um, uh, One of the recommendations that the Select Committee on Youth Health and Development on apprenticeships was that some of the levies should be used to give a grant of 50% to small companies to cover the pay of the apprentice. You've got small companies of by 10, 12, 15 people. The cost of taking one more person on what 15,000 to 20,000 a year is an enormous amount. Mm -hmm. And if some of that surplus money could be spent on giving to certain smaller companies 50% of their actual wage of the apprentices, you'll get many more small companies forming up and prepared by taking on apprentices. I think one of our recommendations from the report was to fund the 16 to 18 mm -hmm. more apprenticeships, wasn't it? Because you know, we have mandatory education. Uh, until 18, and so one of the things we were looking at in the APPP was funding 16 to 18 apprentices, make sure everybody can have that access, recognizing that 16 year olds going to have more, have slightly different needs as an apprentice. To uh, yeah. two years makes a big difference between 16 and 18. And um, but I'd love to get comments from around the table, and I know we've got someone from Richard Hull. Mm -hmm. Hi, sorry, I'm Sam from uh, East Row, and I'd I, I echo some of points about transfer because we can't transfer some of the local businesses because they don't want to take on um, apprenticeship apprentices and commit to all those years. They don't want to take on too many because of the cost. And I'd also agree with 
uh, something that came up, the, the late skills report, and I know Lord Willis has also been saying about trying to reimagine what the apprenticeship levy is, call it what you will, skills levy, a learning levy, but something which better reflects what we're trying to do and what it can be used for. And I think one of the things that we'd like to see is modern courses, um, especially if we're talking about jobs of the future, we need to start doing it now. And it's it's hard if you're coming out of a pandemic and trying to be, you know, teams are growing, they can't afford one day a week, one person for four years or three years or whatever it is, you sort of need the skills skills now. So something like modular courses would really help us actually train people now and get the skills, whether it's digital data, carbon, we find all those skills really useful, but we can't spend 90, 95% of our money. That's really smart. Yeah. Uh, I'm from Richard Holden's office, who's a former co-chair. He's had to leave because he's a Richard Holden MP. He's a former co-chair. He's had to leave because he's become a minister. Mm -hmm. It's obviously very sad about. Um, and we had a really, really good um, program set for the AVBG. We were doing a lot of work kind of to do with the levy and getting um, mm -hmm. trying to make uh, an apprenticeship route for teachers, which I think would address a lot of the issues that we talked about later. Have you spoken about some good things on that? Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I just wanted to say we're very sorry to be leaving. And then we'll be, you know, like I said to Richard myself, I on my thanks to him. And we're going to lobby him now. Now he's on the inside. <laughs> we're counting him as one of the yeah. teams still. Um, yeah. He's in the road, he's in the transport. Yeah, yeah, fast roads. And we get so many, we've had actually just this week, haven't we, communications from the Confederation of Transport about apprenticeships, uh, <laughs> about the train riders. So we're going to keep going. Don't forget to get of course. Oh, it's also Jones. Yes, she was. This is really the big. And what do you want to talk to colleagues and maybe on the embedding green or what are the what are the other skills that should be embedded across the apprenticeships? I mean, I've spoken to people about the speaking, listening, and all the communication. Are there other things that you would want to see for digital green or the more um, controversial issue of if you're over? 24, what's your role as an apprentice? Is there anybody on the screen who wants to find? I mean, it's difficult to see if there are any hands up. Yes, yeah, so we've got a few questions in the chat actually. Oh, great. Uh, so Lee Parsons, the Chief of uh, of Efficiency North, uh, he comments uh, with two billion homes per year to be retrofitted uh, between now and 2050. Do the APG recognise the urgent action is required uh, now to bring about retrofit mm -hmm. apprenticeships, uh, mm -hmm. of which many uh, vital retrofit apprenticeships? Qualifications uh, do not yet exist. Uh, we can take a couple of questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, David Cowdery uh, of MSC uh, says that MSC recognises the need uh, to invest in the training uh, and upskilling uh, of 44,058 heat pump installers needed um, by 2025. 44,058. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Because we just had to have a new heater at home, and it's a hundred pounds an hour we pay in Pimlico Plus for eight hours. Oh well, Pimlico Plus. For eight hours. I think so. Yeah. It's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, his comments uh, focus mostly uh, on uh, heat pumps, uh, and uh, the new low carbon apprenticeships uh, will be a level three qualification uh, covering fundamentals of low carbon heating technologies like heat pumps, with key, key topics including common installation processes and planning. Uh, and then we have uh, a comment from uh, India, uh, India Taylor, um, who says, uh, wonderful to hear from the panel uh, about embedding green skills and apprenticeships. Uh, and again, comments on heat pumps uh, and the need for further skills. Um, uh, and um, oh, particularly with SMEs. Brilliant. And, Toby, do you want to respond to any of? Yeah, I mean, I, I think. Um, Bring in two or three of those together. So I mean, I think I think the point that he throw uh, airport were making about uh, having this fund and not being able to spend it is, is something that's replicated by loads of um, businesses across the private and public sector. Um, and so I think you know there's a number of solutions to that. I mean, the first is that you know we need to make sure we're working with businesses to try and ensure that um, apprenticeships are as relevant as they can be to the modern workplace. I think the thing that loan parties already announced about 
50% of that um, being able to be used more flexibly, more modular, um, has had huge support already for exactly that reason, because not everything looks like an apprentice, um, although they should remain the gold standard. I think when you hear a number of different industries saying, we need this, we need this, we need this, it rather undermines the argument that government should be paying people's wages to take them on, because if everyone's desperately short of staff, if we, in practical terms, have more vacancies and we have unemployed people, why is the government going to pay um, people's wages in order for them to take them on? So, uh, you know, and given the very, um, the very sort of precarious state of public finances, I think, you know, would I be looking to go to the Treasury and say, I want you to pay people's wages at a time when we've got levy on, on spend, we've got companies crying out for um, new workers, I think it'd be hard to justify that. But I do think, you know, your point around, you know, if we're saying up to the age of 18, you are statutory, you know, statutory education, we're willing to pay for you if you go to A level, but we're not willing to pay for you if you go down the apprenticeship route. I think it's a, it's a legitimate question um, at that younger uh, age. And, you know, I think we absolutely need to, to make apprenticeship central um, to the opportunities that, that young people consider. So that, that, that was really, um, was a really important part of the point. I think part of the answer to, to what you're saying, Toby, though, is that the, the, we're talking specifically about small firms, where it is, where it is difficult, they may need the skills, but it's difficult for them to take them on if they can't be sure, sure that they can uh, provide them with the, the full support they can give with the apprenticeship. Well, and, and one of the things I, I know I've mentioned it to Emma and the Secretary is these new flexi apprenticeships, I think they're called more flexible, where, which is uh, very possibly an answer to some of the issues you were making. We have used shared apprenticeships yeah. and stuff, that has been useful. Um, they do need support from the government rather than like the, the apprenticeship training agencies, which just yeah. disappeared without trace. No, I think you're right. I think, in terms of small firms, you know, the biggest issues are around not predominantly about wages. I mean, the bureaucracy around uh, apprenticeships is huge. Um, and this, this whole apprenticeship regime was set up with big businesses in mind. It was the government saying, We think there's great schemes at BAE and Rolls Royce and whatever, want to be on the same sort of scheme. Um, and they've created a monstrous bureaucracy. Um, I'm speaking to independent providers who say for every penny or for every pound they spend on delivering an apprenticeship, they're spending another pound on administering it. They're literally having to employ as many people to administer the apprenticeship schemes as they are to deliver them. Um, and that's got to be wrong. So I think actually do a lot more, give a lot more benefit to small businesses by reducing that bureaucracy, by providing more support um, to independent providers and colleges to actually support the uh, small firms through. The, the necessarily paying the wages and have a better um, use of the public pound. Brilliant. And mm -hmm. Jackie, just before well bringing on the one of my end up there, which might not be the ABPG here, the Ofsted moderating apprenticeships at degree level at the university, that uh, from university to say they don't want to do the degree apprenticeship because they're being up, they're being uh, regulated by the OFS and they're being regulated by Ofsted and Ofsted using the same criteria of universities as they use for schools and they're completely different institutions. So I think there's a issue in this. Jackie, and then Beatrice. In terms of that, I, I think because I'm a college and we do have Ofsted and universities should have to go through that too. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think what we're talking about here though is putting the jigsaw puzzle together of what's fit. A 16 to 18 year old does cost an employer more because it's not just their wages, it's about the supervision and timetable. And therefore, using some of the levy to pay wages for a 16 to 18 year old apprentice is absolutely right, particularly for SMEs. But what we're talking about a lot here, particularly um, with the upskilling and reskilling with the retrofit, is about short provision. Most of the time, you're taking somebody who's already good at a job, like a plumber from um, Pimlico, um, and they just need to upskill to do a specific part on heat pumps. Um, same with a lot of the construction and engineering in industry. And that's where I think the skills side comes in. Apprenticeships must be for the quality side a year or, or more. A lot of them are up to three years for a good quality level three. So that is your 16 to 24 year old getting into a new role, really understanding that. When we're looking about upskilling the current workforce, using the levy, to do something specific, I think would be the appropriate thing to do for the over 24s. But that's 
my personal yes. so far. Really? Mm. Beatrice, did you want to come back in? I must admit, I, I, I'm str I was struggling to hear the question or like the particular, but um, like uh, Emma, like if you could repeat that. We were just um, discussing regulation of uh, apprenticeships and paying for 16 to 18 year olds, what level should they be supported if you're yes. 16 to 18 year old on, a, on an apprenticeship and uh, SME yeah, like taking apprenticeships. Thank you. Sorry, like it, it like uh, it is it, it is a little bit of a challenge, and like uh, uh, I'm really sorry I can't be there in person. But again, um, well, I think the, I think the point that like I think it was Toby uh, Toby raised um, uh, around um, you know we do pay for A level students like uh, to go to A levels and we put, and for T level. So there you know there is sort of a question like you know in terms of looking at these qualifications across the board you know then why would you not in some ways pay fully for like apprenticeships for 16 to 18 year olds um so i think there is something to consider in in this context um i think um in terms of um i also like the, the point around really making sure that like we look at all of these things in the round you know like t levels are also route into apprenticeships you know and how do we make sure that these kind of link into that will be really important and smes will be absolutely vital in getting t-level placements but also apprenticeships going forward so we get enough of them so really looking at ways that we can work with businesses and so that businesses see apprenticeships also as like the the um alleviating the future workforce challenges that they have that help them grow um, and seeing their role and actually in achieving that is really important because one of the things that we do I like, sometimes sort of hear is that people are worried about like if they put somebody through an apprenticeship then they might be poached by somebody else um, and you know and, and questions around that but actually once you start looking at the overall picture of increasing the number of apprentices and the increasing you know the skills that like and, and the workforce um, you will have fewer people poached from you potentially so it's a it's a circle and I, and I think they, they all have a role to play in that. Brilliant, thank you. And I think that really perfectly leads us to the end of our meeting and the end of our session. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Beatrice. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Toby. Lord Baker as our new member. Um, thanks everybody for coming. I hope you I hope you enjoyed that. I thought it was a really good QA there at the end. So lots of issues for you to take away maybe for when we sort of <laughs> Thanks very much, everyone. And thank you again to um, Richard for his service on the uh, on the media We thought that stopped. Good, good. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much.